let's say like a 50% return rate on the controls, then we know that about half of them uh, would be seen if they were there. And so that means that the 20% return rate probably actually represents 40%. Oh. <laughs> yeah. There's a centipede. You guys can have the one that you 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 Each other. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna miss uh, the community here at WNL. I'm gonna miss the WNL community. But what I'm gonna miss the most is being able to leave my backpack everywhere. And I will miss the speaking tradition the most. I'm gonna miss D Hall and Gaines the most. And I'm gonna miss D Hall the most. It's all you can eat, 10 bucks. The thing I'm gonna miss most about Washington and Lee is the dining hall. Come on, baby. You can't beat that all you can eat brunch. Whoa! And I'm gonna miss all my friends in the colonnade. I guess the most I'll miss is just being in Colonnade, taking in the sun, watching everything that happens around me. The Connolly Entrepreneurship Center, as well as my good friend, Dr. Shea. And we're going to miss having close relationships with professors, just being able to stop in in office hours and talk about anything and everything. I miss most about Washington and Lee is the great professors, um, and great classes, and the easy accessibility of those professors. Dr. Melissa Karen, um, she's loving my life and uh, I'm going into South Asian studies because of her. Professor Eastwood, I've definitely majored in Eastwood instead of sociology. I've taken every single one of his classes. And I'm gonna be missing Anna Brodsky and her incredible Russian lessons the most. Definitely Professor Prager in the German department. Definitely, oh sorry, go ahead. Because she's, you know, amazing. <laughs> and shout out to Professor, uh, Professor McClamick. I'm really going to need um, being in your class. <laughs> uh, anything taught by Professor Delaney? Professor Meyer's civil war class, just because he was so energetic and enthusiastic about the material. Dr. Eric Uffelman, because the amount of free ice creams and lunches I've gotten from that man is extraordinary. I'm definitely going to miss the English department the most. I really love everyone in the Shepherd department, just because of how much of community and family we all are. And what I miss the most is all of the unique experiences I've been able to have with my different classes here. I'm going to miss the Science Center and singing with the University Singers. And we're we're going to miss games, games on what? I'm going to miss my friends so much, but also Sweet Things Ice Cream Shop. And I think I'm going to miss Taps the most. And I'm going to miss Blue Sky the most. And I'm going to miss the small community of Lexington and walking into restaurants and knowing more than half the people there and just feeling really loved by everyone in the city and at the school. And I'm going to miss sending Windfall with my boys the most. The, the views, the sunsets on Windfall. And I'll miss the Lexington sunsets the most great friends and the people. I'm going to miss the people here the most. I'm going to miss the people from WNL the most. The thing we're going to miss most about WNL is all our friends. What I will miss most are my forever friends. I'm really going to miss friends that become family. I'm really, really, really going to miss all the amazing friends that I made here at WNL. I'm going to miss the Colonnade. WLU Lex. Pink Professor Mitchell Moore. Pronto. Lex Bricks. The Pink Cadillac. Um, I, I can't decide. Everything? I, everything. <laughs>
All right, thank you all uh, for being here this morning, all you intrepid souls, as we venture into such a unique and exciting concept, our fascination with evil. And my goal this morning uh, is, is to give you basically a panoramic, panoramic concept overview. What is evil? How has it changed over time? Where do we locate its origins? And how do we think about evil, not only as a theological concept or philosophical one, but a concept of history that historians are well equipped to address? And the goal, of course, for today is to provide a foundation, a way of sort of forming a common language about evil and its origins that we can carry through over the next couple of days. Now, at the risk of stating the obvious, evil remains a potent concept. All of you are here because in some way or another, evil has captured your attention and your imagination. Maybe you're a horror movie junkie. Not pointing at anyone, but, but Scott here. <laughs> Maybe you are a scholar of Dante's Inferno, David Peterson. Maybe you've seen evil in some way in your life and tried to grapple with its meaning, its purpose, its causes. All of us are bringing these things to the table, and I think actually that's really critical to acknowledge. We cannot address the concept of evil in an objective way. Evil is personal, evil is subjective, and that actually, I think, is why it is so powerful. Now, in thinking about our fascination with evil, we see it depicted in our world in a whole multitude of ways. Sometimes we think about it as something that's humorous. How many of you remember this film? Oh God, you devil. Uh, when I show this to my students, they get a lot of blank looks. They don't even know who George Burns is. Uh, but this depicts sort of a lovable devil always stirring the pot. Yes, he's evil, but you kind of want to get a beer with the guy, right? That's a fundamental idea. Sometimes, of course, evil looks very different. Sometimes evil, as it's portrayed in film, is a bit more terrifying. And sometimes more terrifying because it's a bit more human. Right? Um, it reflects something about the corrosive underbelly of our own society. There is even, and I think this is very timely, a new TV show debuting in September called Evil. Um, I'm not behind the show, I have to say. Um, they didn't consult me for my expertise, although they could have done. Uh, this will be on CBS, and the whole sort of premise of the show is should evil be encountered and addressed and grappled with as a supernatural phenomenon, a sign of the demonic hand still operating in our world, or should we treat evil as fundamentally a psychological, medical, scientific problem to be reasoned and understood using those sort of methods of proof? And I think what's really interesting is that's the premise of this show coming out in 2019, but that is a very old question. Is evil supernatural? Is it preternatural? Is it human? Is it scientific? Is it anything at all? And, and indeed, I think one of the things to me that's really interesting is how evil still manifests, not just in popular culture, not just you know, in our sort of general media landscape, Halloween costumes, all of that, but also in our political discourse. I did a quick search of headlines of times in which various publications have used evil, um, either the, the people who are writing the journalism are using the term evil or the individuals who are our politicians using the term itself. But evil is politicized, and we oughtn't think that it's, no, that it's not, that it is in some way neutral. So here, of course, we have the Washington Times, um, which I'm not a regular reader of the Washington Times, but I keep getting news alerts now on my computer from them. I don't know how to disable it. It's quite troubling. Um, but you know, the sort of typical, typical lies about an evil socialist agenda. And of course, this is straight from the Cold War period, that rhetoric. Um, on the other side of, of the aisle, 
a headline, and there are actually lots of headlines about this, that you know, when you see sort of creeping fascism in America, should we call it evil? Um, is it the face of evil? And so forth. And we have other sort of less political examples, but still important examples of how we categorize those who we see as deviant as being evil. So here we have from a British paper, um, if the mum didn't give that away, a British paper talking about an evil mum who strangled her baby. Something that has been seen, I think, is the ultimate act of evil for a long time, harming children. Children are at the core, in some ways, of so many of our conceptions of how evil and evildoers operate. Um, I expect we'll come back to this in a, in a range of ways. And indeed, you know, rhetorically, evil as a political concept has its own history. It's not so long ago that during um, the, the period of the Cold War, Reagan denounced the Soviet Union as the evil empire, right? Um, during the Gulf War, Bush 41, who some of you may have just learned about, talked about Saddam Hussein as the devil. And no doubt, Hussein said the same about him. And of course, we'll all remember the beginnings of the Iraq War and the rhetoric that came from Bush 2 about the axis of evil. So again, thinking about the ways in which evil as a concept is a very political one. That's what gives it some of its power. And I think actually I put this quote at the bottom here. Um, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Um, this is a quote that, that became very famous in a speech by John F. Kennedy. We don't actually know who said it. People tend to say it's Edmund Burke, but we don't know that that's the case. It's hard to trace the origins of this. But this is probably the phrase about evil that I see the most trotted out, that people talk about. It's frankly a phrase that I think a lot about in my own role as a citizen of the country and of, of the world. What does it mean for evil to triumph? What does it mean for good men to do nothing? And embedded in this quote is that dichotomy that has long been at the heart of the way the Western world has conceptualized of evil. Good men versus evil. Right? Evil is something other. Evil is something to be battled. Evil is something to be defeated. Otherwise, it will triumph. So you're seeing the you sort of still potency of thinking about the concept of evil in tremendously black and white terms. And again, that will have a very, very long history. Now what I think these few examples illustrate is just, as I said, how pervasive the concept remains. And not just the concept, but also the imagery. Yet as Julia Shaw pointed out in the book that I know all of you read very closely with notes, um, Evil, though we see it a lot, though we say a lot about it, we don't really think about it very much. I don't, we, I don't think we think about what it means. I don't think we think about its history. I don't think we think about the power that it has in the world. Evil is a concept, but evil is also a call to action. Use of the rhetoric of evil is a galvanizing force, and it's a very, very powerful one. So. With all of that said, let's get to the questions that I want us to be considering. I previewed these a little bit yesterday, but I'll, I'll say a bit more now. Um, as, I've, as I've mentioned a number of times, defining evil is a critical challenge. I think there's also the question there of should we define it? Actually, in some ways, just trying to come up with a concrete definition of evil diminish the potency of the concept or not. Is there something that's pure evil? I'll say more about this in my lectures. Or not? Is evil just a version of very bad? Or not? We'll, we'll see. Why has the concept of evil featured so prominently? Political discourse, movies, music. There, I mean, there are all these songs about evil, actually, right? Witchy woman and sympathy for the devil. And, and these are all sort of fun songs. There aren't actually that many songs about evil as a particularly serious concept. Um, but you know, it pervades so much. But how did this happen? And then the final question, I put this in your outline that I want us to think about, not to today per se, but over the next few days, is, is the idea of evil as dangerous as the forces of evil themselves. Do we need evil? I don't really know how I myself would answer this question, but we'll, we'll come back to it. 
So this morning, what I want to do in the next 45 minutes or so is kind of take apart the very first question, the definition of evil and how evil became this powerful lens through which to view the world. How did, what's the history of evil? Now, it's useful to begin with some guiding definitions. In common parlance, we tend to talk about evil in our day-to-day -day usage to mean something that very, very bad or wicked or deviant doesn't quite capture. It's almost as if we, have, as a society, have decided we need another word for things that push beyond the boundaries of what we believe human society ought to be doing and thinking about. Evil is also a concept that is grounded fundamentally in what it is not. Evil, as we have conceived of it for centuries, is the absence of any good or morality. To the extent that folks like Aristotle and Plato actually had anything to say about evil, and classicists will debate this, they meant the absence of knowledge, the absence of anything good. And of course, in Christian society, often evil has been construed as the absence of God. Right, maybe even the absence of a soul. I think this is really important because I think about evil and defining it as sort of a photographic negative of what we want or how the type of person, the type of deity, event, or outcome that one desires. And the photographic piece is really critical. When I say it's a photographic negative, what's important is the concept of evil tells us as much about our own society or a society that uses the term as it does about that thing being labeled evil. And to that extent, I think evil has serves and has long served as a category that can be a container for everything an individual or society rejects. You'll think about those pictures, don't pull them out yet, but when you think about what you wrote down or drew yesterday when I asked you to define evil, you probably drew something that you fundamentally reject. That is the opposite of what you want. Evil is the container for a lot of that. We use evil to denote that which is inhumane, unhuman, and deeply other. And this is where, as I think you'll realize over the next couple of days, that I think the danger of the concept starts to lie. Because we think of evil as transgressive. We might be bad in some way, but they are evil, right? Really, really critical. We need something that can be apart from ourselves in that way. We'll talk much, much more about this. So to understand and I put a mirror up here, I should say, because I do think of evil as sort of this black mirror um, of, of our society. To talk about evil in any historical sense, we have to think very critically and very carefully about the star of the show of evil, um, the figure that has in some ways been the star of my own academic show. Uh, and of course, here I'm talking about Satan. Um, <laughs> Yeah, speak, speak of the devil. Uh, you know, it's funny. So I've written this book on belief in the devil in Scotland. I teach a class on the history of the devil. And students always say to me, but you seem so nice, you know? <laughs> you don't seem like the type of person who really loves studying Satan or Calvinism, for that matter. But there, there you go. Um, uh, one does what, what one does. So for a very long time, particularly I'm talking here about the Christian world, the epitome of evil, the stand-in for evil, the representation of the concept writ large was, of course, the, the evil one himself, Satan. And like the concept of evil more broadly, Satan has almost always been described in negative terms. The enemy of goodness and light, a kind of vicious emptiness, the angel who refused to be one. Satan understood in these negative terms. But Satan has not just been an abstract theological idea. And I think this is really critical. When people, particularly in the pre-modern world, thought about Satan, they didn't sort of closely read passages in Genesis or Matthew that gave them an idea of the devil. They believed Satan was in their homes, 
in their beds sometimes. There's a lot of stuff about sex with the devil. Well, you'll, you'll hear about it, don't worry. <laughs> There's the salacious part, part of all of this. Everyone, there's a PG-13 alumni college program. I feel like we all meet that, that basic, basic age requirement. They, you know, the, the devil was really, really critical in the minds of many, many pre-modern Christians. And there's a long evolution to that fact that I'll talk a little bit about. But first, before I say any more about Satan, it's worth pointing out, and students always ask me this, but did he exist? Well, for the historian, that's kind of an irrelevant question. Satan exists because people believed, and still believe, that he does. And that belief has tremendous amounts of power. And indeed, I would argue very strongly that it's impossible to imagine Christianity or even the world more generally without the concept of the devil, which is the primary lens that I think we still think about the concept of evil through. <laughs> so the first thing to say here about evil is that I think the way that we conceptualize of evil is a problem bound up in the idea of monotheism. That is to say, believing in one all-powerful, all-knowing God. Many, many ancient religions believed in some bad forces, forces of evil, right, to, to some degree. But they were also very comfortable with the idea of gods and spirits that could be both. There was a comfort with a certain degree of duality. Many ancient religions believed they existed in a world of good gods and bad gods and those who embodied both of those characteristics. But as the idea of an all-knowing, all-powerful God develops and an all-benevolent God, the foil for that develops as well, which I'll go on to talk about. To understand Satan, we do have to think about God. Um, and one of the things that's always fascinating to me about modern Christianity is that Satan hasn't actually fared very well. Um, there are a lot of modern people who identify as Christian if you pull them. They believe in God, but don't really believe in the devil. Or if they do believe in the devil, they think about Satan as sort of a, a metaphorical concept, a, a symbolic evil, right? Um, Satan is among us on earth, hell is other people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is, <laughs> there's, there's a lot to sort of think about with, with this. But the devil, for a very long time, believing the devil was not a choice um, for, for Christians. And I'll suggest actually why I think Satan has fared less well than God, and if actually I think there's any logical coherence to that. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this. Now, in the early books of the, what we would call the Christian Bible, or uh, as I think more accurately we think about the Old Testament as the Hebrew Bible, God is presented as both the creator of good and evil. Here I'm thinking of Isaiah. Um, 45-7 for those of you keeping, keeping track. And it says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. In the Old Testament, there is this sort of broader level, and of course, um, I'm painting with a broad brush, but of comfort with a God that can embody both of those characteristics. And it isn't until the later books of the Bible, until the New Testament, when God is created as extremely good, all good, that the foil to God, this sort of independent, powerful Satan develops. And the reason is because of what I think um, is one of the, the most interesting questions in all of Christian history, and indeed all of philosophy. The question of, if you have over the course of the New Testament, this all good, all benevolent God develop, then why in the world is there evil? Why in the world is there evil? If you have the development of this extremely powerful devil, how do you explain that? Does it help solve the problem of evil? And the problem of evil, um, I should, going slightly ahead here, we'll come back to this. The problem of evil is known by historians, philosophers, theologians as theodicy. You saw this in, in your outline. How, if there's human suffering, we see it everywhere. Wars, famines, plagues, people just doing terrible things. If God is all-powerful, if God is all-knowing, why does he let that happen? 
that idea of that all-knowing God in the New Testament leads to the development of an all-powerful Satan. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you some specific examples here. In the Old Testament, or, or the Hebrew Bible, if you read through, even through Job, for example, which is probably the most sort of famous text that people think about when they think about the concept of the devil. The devil is really just one of God's many sort of adversaries, and indeed, Satan is even a tool of God sent to tempt and try one of his followers, right? God, Satan is one of sort of many adversaries. But in the New Testament, Satan doesn't just become the Satan or a Satan. He becomes Satan. Personal noun, looming large, tremendously important. And the Bible, and this is disappointing to some of my students when they take my devil in the Western world class, it does not present a coherent narrative of who the devil is, where he came from. In fact, a lot of our core ideas about Satan come not from the sort of traditional canon of the Old and New Testament, but from the Gnostic Gospels, from the Apocrypha, things that were sort of systematically and purposely left out, right, of what is our dominant sort of text for thinking about things. Well, we'll come back to this a little bit more later. Now, one of the points that I want to make here is that as we move into the New Testament, um, and God um, is presented as all-powerful, all-benevolent, and Satan becomes an increasingly important figure. Satan is also a tremendously important figure for the rising goodness and importance of Jesus, right? Again, another foil to that epitome of goodness. There's this very di tendency for dichotomous thinking that emerges in the early Christian tradition. This leads to this rise of Satan is not just one of many adversaries, but the adversary of foil to God, to a reinterpretation of older books of scripture. A reinterpretation, for example, of Genesis 3. Now, everyone probably knows the story of what happens in the Garden of Eden. Um, a woman is to blame. Um, the, the basic story is, of course, it's always, yes, it's always, well, there'll be more of this. Uh, we'll talk more about this. But the basic story is, of course, this cunning serpent tempts Eve to transgress the laws of God, um, to eat the forbidden fruit, to share it with Adam. And, of course, the consequence of doing this becomes the lodestone for the rest of Christian thinking. Original sin, the fall, the post-lapsarian condition. Now, in Genesis, nowhere is the cunning, articulate serpent named a Satan. Not a once. And in fact, in the sort of very earliest works of Christian theology, he's not considered to be Satan. He's literally just a really troubling serpent, right? <laughs> um, but, but in the second century, as the books of the New Testament began to be composed and, and become popularized, people read back, as a figure of Satan emerges in the text, people read back on these older books of scripture and think, well, that's not just any old snake. It's Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub, the father of lies, a tempter from the beginning. And this has massive implications, right? Because from the beginning, this connects the problem of evil embodied in Satan to the human condition. They're wedded from the start. Human sin, Satan, two sides of a coin that was forged in what was meant to be a purity, a world of purity, a perfect garden. And of course, this has a lot of implications for thinking about the relationship between women and the devil. Because if Eve was so gullible, if she was so credulous, so easily tempted, a vessel for all of these sorts of evil thoughts and incursions, then how can women be trusted? Well, when we talk about the witch trials, this will emerge. I always like to show this. You, I previewed it earlier. Um, <laughs> if you see a Toyota Prius in the parking lot with this sticker on the back of it, I like to check a lot of stereotypes about professors. You know, Prius, you know, <laughs> various bursts of bumper stickers. OK. Um, and there, there you go. Um, 
I think one of the things that I, I really ought to also mention as we talk about the sort of evolution of this concept of the devil in Christian, in the Christian tradition and Christian theology is that the devil's actions, all of them, even when Satan emerges as this powerful figure and a foil to God, they're still, all of his actions are still contingent on the permission of God. This is really critical. Christian theologians were stuck with this problem. First, they have the problem of evil. How can an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-benevolent God allow evil to exist? Oh, well, he's not the author of any evil. Satan does it. Okay, well, that's a, that's a helpful answer. But wait, if Satan has all this power, then is God actually all-powerful and all-knowing? So then they had to come up with the ways to think about the sort of relationship between Satan and God. Was Satan an independent actor, or was he, in some ways, the hangman of God? And in a lot of medieval and early modern texts, you see this constant reference to the permission of God, allowing Satan to do things. This allowed God to be all-powerful, but not to be the author of evil. Satan is God's hangman. He's the executor of justice on a deserving human society. Remember the original sin. Now, if any of you who are less well-versed in Christian theology or who are sort of confused by this, this might seem like a lot of tangling in knots, a lot of sort of ways of trying to read solutions into the material. And indeed, it is a really hard question. And libraries have been filled with folks trying to square this circle of the problem of evil, of an all-powerful God, of a devil who is among us and involved from the beginning really, really challenging for folks to figure out. Um, you have a lot of, of people who sort of sort through it by saying, well, the devil is the servant of God in some ways. He hates God. He, he's sort of inherently moving towards evil and injustice, but he's a tool of, of the almighty God in other ways. And that God's fundamental thing that he does with Satan is to bring light out of darkness. You see a lot of people using that rhetoric to explain why evil happens in the world. It may be happening to a deserving fallen human population. It may be part of a divine plan. Let me give you a really specific way to think about this. So let, let's say all of your hands, everyone puts, put out their hand. Okay. Out, you're holding it out. I'm about to put something in your hand, metaphorically. All right. Imagine that I put a scorpion in your hand. I'm from Texas. I've seen these guys. I know what they look like. Pretty scary. The scorpion bites you. And there were people who would say, Tell me evil doesn't exist in the world. How do we explain that? Why does God let this sort of horrible creature like a scorpion into the world and bite my hand, inflicting venom into my veins? Well, what some people said in order to show this relationship between God and the devil is that you're not thinking about it the right way. Augustine wrote about this, who David will talk a little bit about later. You're not thinking about it the right way because yes, it's evil to you. And the scorpion itself may be an agent of evil in this circumstance. But biting you wasn't bad for the scorpion. And maybe when you were in church the other day, you were having some impure thoughts. <laughs> maybe you have wronged your neighbor. Maybe you didn't you know, do the required levels of penance, whatever. And your punishment isn't actually evil, but part of the plan. OK, well, I'm happy to explain this more, but it's a challenging way of thinking, but it's one in which this is the context, the, the sort of intellectual ether into which Satan arose into, as William Blake would describe him, the great red dragon. I love this image, by the way. Um, it's on a number of books about the devil, uh, some of which I've made my students buy, and then they feel very awkward carrying this around on campus. Their, their friends are concerned, but they blame me. Okay. <laughs> So moving forward in time a little bit with these sort of basic foundations of the concept of the devil emerging, right? This movement from Satan being one of many adversaries, not a particularly important being in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, to being this powerful foil for God and indeed an attempt to answer the problem of evil. How do we get to a moment in which Satan is constantly being mobilized for various purposes in a given society? 
And this brings us to, I think, one of the uses of evil, the concept of evil, that has been so powerful. And this is the idea of demonizing others, mobilizing the devil as a category, a way to define people who are not you. And one of the things that happens over the course of the late antique and into the medieval period is Satan becomes increasingly seen as the leader of the opposition, right? Um, of any sort of group or institution that is seen as fundamentally opposed in some way to the project of good and godly society. And enemies of a given society, of Christian society. Here I'm talking about the Christian West. Um, this is before the Reformation. I'm talking about Catholic society. Enemies of the Catholic Church, enemies of the Western society, they were not just bad agents. They were in league with Satan. And, and I think this is critical, they had to be dealt with as such. Had to be dealt with as such. Now, I should note, and I think this is important, I'm not claiming that Christianity invented the concept of evil. I don't even think, actually, that Christianity invented the idea of demonizing others. We could certainly debate this. There's a fabulous scholar called Elaine Pagels who's written a lot about the origins of some of these ideas. Virtually all people across time and space have had a tendency Two, for various reasons, and we can ask about whether it's innate or cultural or caused by inequality or whatever, but to denigrate those that they defined as other, to see them as inferior, maybe even less human. The Egyptian word for human being, for example, just means Egyptian, right? Everyone else maybe wasn't. The Greeks very explicitly regarded everyone who didn't speak Greek as a barbarian. Right? These are sort of the, the origins of some of that, that rhetoric. What Christians did in thinking about the process of demonization was add a moral interpretation of difference, a moral and theological interpretation of difference. It was read to mean if someone was different, if someone was other, they were potentially a servant of Satan. We are God's people. You are the devil's. That is tremendously important. And I think has had really, really lasting consequences in how we think about the world. Now, David will say more about this later today, but I just want to give you sort of an overview about how these ideas about the devil evolved between the writings of Augustine in the late 4th and early 5th century, all the way through the period that we think about as sort of the Renaissance and the Reformation. During this era, so from roughly the 4th century to the 15th, the devil grew to the apex of his power. You had all of these scriptural foundations. People were reading them. People were also reading gospels that weren't part of, of the sort of main canon, right? The Apocrypha, Gnostic gospels, and so forth. But they had this main idea of the devil as an adversary and as a sort of leader of the opposition. And that becomes more and more pronounced as Christianity and as the Catholic Church as an institution finds its firmer footing in society and perceives itself as under attack from enemies within and enemies without. Now the question is then, how did ordinary people in Christian Europe when they thought about their enemies, how do they know to associate them with Satan? How does Satan become elevated for the ordinary person who's maybe not counting angels on a pinhead, right? Um, which I actually think, just as a side note, I actually think that that's a really relevant question. Um, and so folks like, you know, uh, Thomas Aquinas and others would spend hours thinking about you know, how many angels can fit in a square meter? Or if, if hell exists and people are resurrected bodily and they go to it, do they defecate in hell? They really wanted to know the answers to these questions. And we laugh about them. And they are, I mean, one does wonder how much mead is being consumed as these sorts of questions are being, being asked. But if you believe in hell, if you believe in a heaven, why not ask these questions? Aren't they actually the rational questions to ask? Anyway, we, we, I, can, I can say more about that if, if, I, if, I, if I have a chance later. But the way that these ideas were communicated to ordinary people, 
the way the devil grew in the popular imagination as well as in the theological foundations of the medieval world was, of course, through art in one way. Um, it's really between the 6th and the 8th century that you actually start to get depictions of the devil on church frescoes. In a lot of saints' lives stories, the devil starts getting painted and depicted quite a lot. Again, the use of this sort of black and white um, dichotomous foil becomes really, really critical. Um, preachers, of course, even in the medieval period, preaching was slightly less important than after the Reformation, but still pivotal. And preachers would talk about the devil going about like a roaring lion, right? P from Peter. Um, all, of, all of this really critical. And people, pamphlets, you know, after the printing press um, was developed in the 15th century would describe the devil hiding in people's houses, hiding in the woods, tempting those who were not wary to do the worst deeds at the back of their minds, right? Um, all of these things help to sort of expand the image of Satan in the popular imagination. And amid all of this, amid the rising, not just theological importance of the devil, but his visibility, the Christian West also began to become increasingly concerned that the apocalypse was nigh. This is also really important. And if you're gonna ask the question of how evil was understood historically, and why the Christian West became so fixated on evil as manifested by the doings of Satan. You have to understand that they believed that they're living in the last days. And as such, according to the book of Revelation, Satan is loose from his chain. He is out. He is about. And he is, is making some, some waves. And I think for, to frame this less theologically and more historically, of course, in this period, and here I'm talking 11th, 12th, 13th century, the Catholic Church is having a hell of a time of it. The Christian West is very stressed out. The Ottoman Empire is growing in power. There are um, lands considered by Christians to be their holy sites that are being occupied by Muslim communities, right? That the Crusades begin in earnest. At the same time, one of the things that you have happen is the Christian church is more and more organized, more and more structured. And there's an attempt to draw a more definitive circle around deeds, practices, ways of engaging with the supernatural world that are considered orthodox and appropriate. And everything outside of that circle is not just pagan. It's not just dabbling in magic. But hey, it's actually demonic. That association also becomes really critical. So there's an attempt to look for enemies without and enemies within. And people primarily are concerned with the devil they know. Satan from the beginning is often construed as an intimate enemy. From the beginning, he was a fallen angel. He came from within. And so this leads to huge attempts to root out heresy, because again, a heretic is not just someone who believes something bad. A heretic is someone in league with the devil and probably meeting in great underground sex where they have underground sort of sex where they're having lots of sex with <laughs> demons and each other, um, committing cannibalistic infanticide, doing whatever. All of these sort of fantasies about heretics develop to further sort of illustrate just how not just unhuman but anti-human they are. They are fundamentally evil. Right, that becomes very much associated with it. We'll see more about this when I talk about the witch trials tomorrow. Of course, um, I would be very remiss if I did not point out that one of the real vic one of the groups that was the extreme victim of this rise of panic about Satan and this sort of persecuting mentality that developed in the medieval period was, of course, Jewish communities. Right? Um, this is an unfortunate trend in history, but it's certainly the case in medieval Europe that Jews were also seen not just as those who would not convert to Christianity, but those who were in league with the devil. That becomes quite critical. Lepers as well even became viewed as demonic, bearing the marks of God rejection on their skin. Right. They're evil in their own way. So there's a historian called... Um, R.I. Moore, who's written about this period in the 12th century when the Christian West became a persecuting society. Now, I could poke scholarly holes in that argument, but I think the broader message does bear out that as the church rose in its power, Satan became a sort of real object of fear, and there was a constant looking about for where his servants in society might be. 
And this persecuting mentality would consider uh, continue bang on through the Reformation. This concern that the servants of the devil were all among us. Martin Luther, a man who was, I think in many ways, obsessed with the devil. There's even uh, what is definitely an apocryphal story, probably not true at all, but that Martin Luther, when he was working in his study, thought he saw the visage of the devil, and he picked up his ink pot and hurled it at the wall to sort of, I guess, I don't know if that's a great strategy for warding off Satan to throw, but, you know, you use what tools you have at your disposal. And he, he's, a, he's a monk, right? He doesn't have a knife or something. I, maybe he did. I don't know. But and, and this is very likely not a true story, but if you go visit Martin Luther's home and study, they'll still point to the ink on the wall and say, that's the spot where he tried to get rid of the devil. Like most Martin Luther stories, like the nailing of the 95 Theses, probably not true. Anyway, historians are all about dispelling people's myths about, about things. But Martin Luther, very concerned with Satan, wrote in 1535 to a friend, Satan reigns over the whole world as his domain and fills the air with ignorance, contempt, hatred, and disobedience of God. Right? That idea, Satan reigns over the world as his domain. Now, these folks did not want to slide into the very slippery heresy of Manichaeism, right? This, this very sort of dangerous and old idea that the world was sort of dualistically governed, right, by a, by a God figure and a devil figure. They wanted to stick with the monotheism idea, right? It's all God, all sovereign. But you can start to see where they're painting the devil as this almost autonomous, equally powerful force, even as, on the other hand, they say, but with the permission of God. It's a tricky thing. It's hard, hard to do. And one of the, the things, my whole point about this rise of a persecuting society, the attempt to demonize others, to use the devil to do so, is that this led in the early medieval and early modern period to a theological but also to a social tendency to demonize certain groups and perceived enemies by casting them in league with the devil. And when you do that, when you view them not as individual agents who might have some bad ideas or do some bad deeds or deviate from what society deems appropriate, but if they're in league with the devil and if they are legion, if they are a great underground group seeking to overthrow Christendom, to subvert social norms, then the crimes they committed are not just bad, they're not just illegal, but they're evil. And because they're evil, they're exceptional. And because they're exceptional, the normal rules that a society believes you ought to use to treat your fellow human beings, those go out the window. And I think we have to really be thoughtful about even making comparisons in our own world, that if you deem a crime exceptional, if you deem an enemy evil, then do you have to follow the laws that we have collectively agreed are necessary and righteous? And of course, I'm thinking about things like terrorism, the treaters of, pr treatment of prisoners at Guantanamo Bay, thinking of those folks as evil, and maybe you think that they are. I, I actually don't know where I come down on this, but the moment you label them as such, you can tr trespass against all the rules of engagement. That will happen a lot in the witch trials, which I have quite a lot to say about, and you'll hear tomorrow. But we must move on for now. Now, in this sort of panoramic sweeping overview, I've talked about the periods in which Satan was taken as a given, as the embodiment, the reservoir of all evil. But I think one of the things that's true, even of this period of the pre-modern world, the pre-enlightenment period, even as Satan is seen as sort of cosmological, supernatural in some way, he's always connected to humans, right? It's humans who are his agents. It's human sin that emerged out of that slippery serpent who is Satan, as people came to believe. And what you have happen um, in the Enlightenment period, and I'll talk about this in a couple of days, is this increasing move away from belief in the devil as the embodiment of evil to an increasing focus on human evil. Evil was still powerful, still potent, but you didn't need to believe in a literal devil to see evil all around you. You didn't even need to believe in the devil to believe that there were groups of people who served the cause of evil. And indeed, 
even though we often use the term medieval to talk about things that are bad or that we consider evil, we all know that the 20th century witnessed some of the most powerful, most profound horrors in human history. Right? Evidence of evil, much less the concept, have not, has not gone away. Has not gone away. And of course, the figure that immediately springs to mind when people talk about our sort of modern concept of evil that can exist even separate from the devil is, of course, Adolf Hitler. Right? I'm sure many people have called him the devil, right? thought about him in, in that way. Um, and of course, he orchestrated one of the greatest and most appalling tragedies in human history with the Holocaust. Others might answer that evil has historically been personified by Stalin. Right? Or, I think maybe more controversially, in the development and use of the atomic bombs. There's been a lot of discussion about the rightness of that choice. And other manifestations of evil and ways in which we think about them and even connect them maybe to the supernatural force are present today in the 21st century, um, very close to home. Anybody know what this image is of on the left? Okay, people marching across UVA's campus an hour from here, chanting Jews will not replace us. Are these the faces of evil? Are they serving a concept that, that we think of in that way? No, we should have to think about, about how that sort of manifests. And of course, a lot of people talked about evil after the shooting at Sandy Hook in Newtown, right? And after um, these mass shootings, particularly when children are involved, and I want to be more specific, white children, there is a lot of real anxiety about the forces of evil in the world. So my point is, we've moved away from this sort of scriptural, in some ways, moved away from this scriptural interest in the idea of the devil. We've moved away, in some ways, from belief in a literal physical Satan, although we can talk about if the spiritual devil still exists for a lot of people. But the concept of evil, it's with us, and it's personified, and it's intensely political. So. I think whether or not evil is human or demonic, the concept has a history that is still informing how we think about it. So what I want to do in the very last sort of little bit of this lecture, who brought their drawings? Did everyone follow the rules? Oh, I see some shamed faces. Raise your hands if you brought your drawings. OK, if you didn't bring them, that's OK. Raise your hand if you remember what they were. I don't know how many drinks people had after dinner last night, but all right, hopefully you remember what you wrote or what you said. So I want to return to this. I've given you a very sort of broad overview of the beginnings of, of the concept of evil and the devil and the uses and abuses of Satan. But I asked you on that very first day, I purposely did not give you any hints, any clues, any even overview of what I was going to do, because I wanted your mind to go to what it thinks of as evil without really having to think about it. So does anybody want to share what they, what they either wrote or drew? You don't actually have to show it unless you want to. But just to, all right, Rob, yes, volunteer. I'll volunteer. Well, if I've seen my drawing in various versions in your slide program. Oh. Really curious. Well, <laughs> uh, I do have preternatural knowledge. This is. OK, yeah. the door opening into darkness, the void. Yes. And, and the thing I love about that is, because it's a door, it's of us, but it goes there. Right. You know, Very, very critical. OK, so that sort of relationship is really important. All right, who else wants to volunteer what they read or what they drew? Anybody? Yes. OK, you drew, who, who else drew Hitler or a swastika or something like that? OK, I, if you ask students, too, this is definitely where they go. And, and I'm sure that we can talk more about the sort of tendency to think about evil now through really the lens of Hitler, right? I mean, I think um, there's a slightly overplaying of, of some of that. OK, good. But absolutely, what else? All right, who else wants to share what they wrote? Yes? The vision came last night. I wrote the word. I'll make it quick. Yes. Going to Central America in the Middle East, looking into the face of Venus Casanova, who was running all the death squad work. Yes. Um, and looking at me as, as a priest, I didn't know I'd been in the Marine Corps. Ah. And, he, and I asked the question to him, what, would, what if we stopped having military aid coming in here 
what would happen, what would happen? And he looked with cold eyes at me and said, how many Marines do you think it would take to do what you want us to do? Okay. And here's more of the punchline for me. Yeah. I saw myself. Because I could have killed. Yes. So uh, it was an incredible opening to that kind of understanding. Yes. I've seen it many times now, but that was powerful to me. Okay, Th that is such a, thank you for sharing that because I think one of the things that I think perplexes so many of us about evil, and really it's one that perplexed Augustine, it's one that troubled various popes, it's one, it's one that, that Luther and Calvin and Spinoza and Nietzsche and all of these folks have thought about, is the devil is evil something external or is it us? Um, are we capable of it? The rhetoric of one's inner demons, we're going to hear a lot about this, is really important. We may have moved from thinking about a literal external devil, but we really think about the evil within us, our own inner demons. And could we, in various circumstances, commit evil? Where is that line? Are we above that? We like to demonize others. We like to use that as a tool to create a gulf between ourselves and what we deeply fear might be true about ourselves. It's a projection, it's a deflection, right? And it's always been such. And I think that that's really, really critical. So yeah, that, that's fantastic. I also loved what you said about looking into the head of the firing squad, sort of cold eyes, because that always comes up. And people thought of the devil as very cold, right? Again, cold absence. Right, different. Okay, good. Who else wants to share what they what they wrote? Yes, or Drew. I have a true phobia that's affected my life. Yes. Being a biology major, I I have a phobia of snakes. Fantastic. So I, I, if one were in the room, I would have all kinds of sympathetic reaction. I probably couldn't stay here. And I drew a picture that I've had to turn over sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't know where it comes from, but I just have, I have some suspect it yeah. something. <laughs> well, I have some Any thoughts. Help. <laughs> no, you know what? This is so fascinating um, that you point this out, Brenda. So my husband is equally terrified of snakes. In fact, if there's one on TV, we have to change it. We're never going to get to go to India together because he read somewhere about a cobra in a toilet that bit someone on the rear end. I don't know. So, you know, we're, but, but so this is a. It's a no. Sorry. Okay, I'm not trying to trigger any reactions. But but I actually think that reinterpretation of the story in Genesis has been really powerful, actually. Now, there are other folks who are interested in sort of behavioral psychology who also talk about how people perceive snakes as moving in a way that's really unnatural. And that language is also often a stand-in, or at least a component of how we conceive of the concept of evil. Right, so yeah, but, but the imagery of the evil snake, I mean, and some of that's also, frankly, just sort of survival skills, right? Snakes can bite you, they are poisonous. There's also that reaction. But I think we shouldn't underestimate those uh, second and third century rereadings of Genesis and, and what they've done for the poor snake population. Um, I don't like them either, to be honest. Yes? Wasn't there always a kind of general connotation that a snake was a sexual thing and yes. that females were brought the fear of the snake entering. Well, so I wouldn't, I, I don't know that I would ever say anything was always, um, and nor do I actually know definitively the, the pre-Genesis history of attitudes towards the snakes. Snakes have occupied various places in different, different religious groups that pre, long predate Christianity. Um, so I'm not an expert on any of that, but what I will say is in the period that I really study, the 16th and 17th century, where people were burning women at the stake for the crime of witchcraft, and some men, mostly women, we'll, we'll talk about this tomorrow, without a doubt in some of the lurid descriptions of these witches meeting with the devil, fornicating with the devil, to use their sort of rhetoric about this, there was this incredibly phallic dimension in thinking about the devil, the devil's member. There are pages written about the devil's, you know, the, the, the devil's, devil's member, as, as they put it, um, and some explicit connections to, and, and, and actually not even just explicit, but depictions 
of this sort of sexualization of this very phallic symbol of the serpent. So from the beginning, women are seen as vulnerable both spiritually but also physically to the incursions of the devil um, in the form of a serpent or you know the, the devil's cold member or whatever. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll hear more about that, but yeah, so that's really interesting. Okay, yeah, Scott, what do you Yeah, this was just such a great question. If I could quickly add to that, you know, outside the yeah. Western context that, that Dr. Rock is talking about, and I know if you're interested in East Asia, and um, the serpent, the dragon, serpent yeah. people uh, tend, are images of enlightenment, mm. uh, luck, wisdom. It's actually very interesting to compare yeah. the mythology of the Chinese dragon to what the dragon becomes in the West. How the, is, the dragon gets identified absolutely. with the yes. bright red dragon yes. as yeah. opposed to a celestial power. Yeah, so I mean, again, I think this suggests the sort of, even for those of us who are not professing Christians or weren't raised in a Christian tradition, we all, this is the water that we swim in, right? It's, it's, or culture is the water that you swim in without actually knowing you're swimming in it, right? And so we're all informed by that sort of shared pool of cultural meanings about the devil, about the snake, all of that. But it would be different in a, in a different society. Yeah. And and a, a, one of the most famous snakes in the history of world religions is Mukalinda, who was a, a Naga who sheltered the Buddha yeah, uh, and yeah, gained yeah. enlightenment along with him yes. at the Bodhi tree. Yes. Um, other, so what else did y'all draw or write? Who else wants to share? Yes. Okay. We have an image here. <laughs> That's the gate of Auschwitz. Okay. Uh, okay. So it's not a person, but a not place. Not a person, a place, yes. Yeah, that's fantastic. So hell on earth, right? Lorded over by Satan. Evil is what we do to other people, right? right? Okay, yeah, a absolutely. And I think um, one of the things that is so interesting to me is, I mean, I've heard people who've gone to Auschwitz or, or Dachau or, or various other sort of places associated with the Holocaust and talked about this sort of, feeling this pervasive blanket of evil sort of that's still lingering in the place. And, and these are friends who are totally secular, but who still sort of feel, and I actually think that's a really important point. When we think about things like the Holocaust, when we think about the transatlantic slave trade, when we think about some of the greatest atrocities in human history, sometimes the scientific explanations, even for those of us, or the social explanations, even for those of us who are totally secular, they're not enough. They're not enough. And I'm going to explore that over the next couple of days um, because that's, it's a really interesting question. All right. Who else wants to volunteer what they share? Well, you drew eyes. Do you want to? Uh, the eyes are always the gateway to the soul. Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You just I look at the eyes. They look so deep and so evil and so okay. ominous. And I think that's another thing that, I, that is tremendously interesting to me, that the way human eyes are unique. And if your eyes are other, unnatural, something else, right, that could be a sign of one's evil. And, and, and indeed, often you see evil depicted as the eyes are black, right, the void of anything beyond them. Yeah, okay, good. Maybe just one or, one or two other folks sharing. This is fabulous. All right, well, who else wants to bravely share what they wrote or what they drew? Yes. Right. Well, for some reason, and this is a different take, um, I, I thought of a... a picture on the cover of my daughter's book that's called Gre it's Grendel yes. the monster from, yeah. from Beowulf. Okay. Um, but it's it's um, also he's kind of like screaming his head is lifted and screaming like he's he's evil but he's in pain. Okay. Evil but in pain. This is fantastic. One of the things that I think has really happened and I think you can date it from around Milton, Paradise Lost written at a moment when people are starting to think about evil is not just a supernatural concept, but indeed a human one, right? Um, to talk, well, I should say people thought about that before, but it becomes very, very common. Um, there's, one, one of the things that I think is interesting about monsters, and Scott will know, know much more about this than I do, but the devil becomes more sympathetic, and in some ways, in some ways almost more monstrous in a human way, right? Not the sort of winged demon in the clouds, but sort of the monster among you. And what's interesting about monsters is, I mean, nobody talks about the devil's emotion. I've thought about writing a book on this. People, don't, I mean, people talk about envy, rage, maybe lust, but they don't talk really until Milton in any extensive way about the devil feeling pain 
or want or loss or any of those things. But when people start to talk about monsters, they're this sort of hybridized, they're a little bit demonic, but they're also very human. They're a manifestation of our concern with our own inner demons, right? And do you feel sympathy? I mean, Beowulf is all sort of about this question, right? Do, when do you feel sympathy for monsters? When do you not? What makes a monster? And what does that make you? Um, and this, I'm sure, will come be much better done by Scott um, uh, later on with, with, with sort of his talk. Okay, one more, one final. Anybody? Yes. Well, I just wrote some words, and one of them was pain. Okay, pain, and suffering. Yeah. yeah. And one of them was heredity. Mm. Okay, Un unpack that for me. I think people who do evil have been surrounded by evil. Okay. Yeah. So the great nature versus nurture question about evil. Exactly. And, you know, that was a question that they skated over in a lot of the period that I'm studying because they didn't think of those things in those terms necessarily. But yeah, now we have that fundamental question, right? Um, and the Shaw talks about this. Was Hitler, you know, inherently evil? Was he evil because of the circumstances he grew up in? Was he evil for some supernatural reason? Was he evil because he had a fundamental cognitive, neurological, chemical? I mean, how does one grapple with this? And that has massive implications for the criminal justice system because where do you locate culpability? If someone is a pedophile because something is wrong in their brain and you fix it and they're no longer that, is an action evil, is a person evil, where do you, where do you go with that? And these are massive tangles that, that we're sort of grappling with in, in profound ways. So yeah, that's, but, but suffering, I should also say, has long been a stand-in for evil, right? Satan is an agent of suffering, though arguably God and his wrath. But hum don't forget original sin. Human des humans deserve it. That that's critical to understanding why that's powerful. So, all right, I'll just close um, by again reiterating that I think evil is a very important but also very galvanizing concept. It's called arms. It's a black mirror. It's a focal point. Um, and I think that we ought to ask together that even if we can do without belief in a literal Satan, can we ever put the concept of evil to bed? Voltaire once sort of said that if the devil didn't exist, it would be necessary to invent him. Might we say the same about evil? I'll leave you with that. So, thanks.